Well, it's Friday, May 14th in 2010, and I'm sitting with Bob Anger, who just happens to be visiting Penn State for his granddaughter's graduation tomorrow, which looks to be a beautiful day. Uh, Bob, what I'd like to do is divide your life sort of into two sections, okay? First, um, well, it, we're looking at pre and post AT&T. One second. Yeah. One second. I, uh, wait. Uh, Bob, what I'd like to do is divide your life into two sections, pre and post AT&T. Um, when you were elected to the Page Society, you were a corporate vice president for public relations at AT&T. Correct. Let's talk about what got you there. Let's talk about your life before that and all the experiences up to that point that landed you at AT&T. Well, after the war, that's the big one. <laughs> I worked for Western Electric starting in 1946, and I had 35 years there. And Ed Block decided, he was AT&T's vice president, that he would like me to come over with a divestiture coming up of the Bell system and uh, to help move a lot of people back to their companies to set up the AT&T Foundation and to do, you might say, a lot of the administrative work that uh, was required to set up the new AT&T. So, uh, about after what, 30... When was that? About what? 19, uh, let's see, 1981. I was with AT&T for 21 months. 35 years with Western Electric. 10 or, I guess, uh, nine of them as vice president of public relations, which also had public affairs active, in other words, the legislative kind of thing too. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I went over to AT&T, I did not have responsibility for getting out press releases or any of that sort of stuff. It was more an administrative kind of thing. And I helped set up the Arthur Page Foundation was I guess my name ought to be on the initial document. Mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit at, at, at Western Electric. Just, let's just go back there for a minute. Um, do you remember at that point if the company had any kinds of ethics codes or mission statements where they talked about um, ethical behavior and social responsibility? I don't remember anything. I always felt Western Electric, and I think this with the whole Bell system, was an ethical kind of operation. And we didn't have the problems that some of these, like the financial businesses have today. Uh, so, no, I always mentioned to my wife many times, I said, you know, there aren't a lot of people grasping for the next rung. I mean, you don't feel it's highly competitive. It seems to be merit, mer a meritocracy. And if you do your job, why, well, yeah, you just might get promoted. And that happened to me. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, never did anything obvious. And I don't remember. In the purchasing department, we had to be careful of certain laws. In other words, you could not get a lower price for something by squeezing the supplier or you'd be in trouble with the law. So we did know a little bit about ethics in the purchasing department. And we did the Bell system purchasing. In other words, I helped set up telephone directory contracts and printing contracts for the Bell, Bell companies, which Western Electric used to do. What do you think, think was the, the key factor that established the trust that the citizens of the United States had in the whole Bell system? Well, I don't know. It's an essential service. It was done well. Uh, everything worked. And you know, if once your phone was finished and you moved why it was returned to Western Electric, we repaired it, put it back so it was like new, and you got another phone so wherever you went. Um, I don't know. It's just, I guess if I was selling liquor, it would be a little different. Mm 
<laughs> but I always felt that because of this was an essential service, that it was uh, something people appreciated and it worked. And many of my friends after the divestiture were grousing because now it didn't work the same way. But admittedly, with the electronic age, you couldn't control it the way you used to. It sort of had to happen. So, um... And Arthur Page, I think, helped set a stage for that way back. Uh, but it was in, a... Uh, in what ways did he help set that stage? Well, he made the, what you, the way you ought to handle your public relations through uh, telling it like it is, being, uh, you might say, uh, a little humorous about it, uh, being factual, being ahead of the curve, you might say, and uh, that was Im important. But we didn't have major problems. Mm -hmm. At Western Electric, we started having a few problems. You know, we're a manufacturing company, so when you had to get rid of scrap, some of it, you might say, toxic, or uh, you always gave it to a supplier, but you had to be sure that that supplier was taking it to the right place. Otherwise, you could be in trouble because you're the big guy, and they're gonna, always going to come after you. So we were very careful in our various factories to make sure that the vendor that was handling our scrap waste materials from the manufacturing process went to the right place to dust, get rid of it. I know the page traveled around, made speeches at various places. Did you ever hear about the speeches that no. Did you ever hear anything, any quotes by him or anything? No, no, I did not. He was, of course, long before me. And, of course, Ed Block became sort of a student of Arthur Page. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got to know a little ab about him, obviously, through setting up the, fa the society. But uh, as far as hearing, you know, he was quoted from time to time. Okay. But... Uh, as far as making that a part of a curriculum or a conference, mm -hmm. yeah, I really never encountered that. Uh, mm -hmm. It might have on a couple of times, but I've forgotten. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, what education and or uh, previous professional experience best prepared you, or do you think anybody, for the rigors of ethical decision making. I mean, how, how, where does this knowledge come from? Where would it well, I think ethical decision making comes from your whole background, from your family. I mean, if your parents were ethical people and you, let's say, helped others. I was raised during the Depression and uh, my folks were very active in helping to take care of people like that. In fact, my dad was in social work anyhow. Mm. So perhaps that kind of thing rubbed off. Mm -hmm. But uh, and I was raised in Dover, Delaware, which is a small town uh, from the second grade on. So mm. uh, it was a great place to grow up, and I have three brothers, so we had a good family. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing, uh, you know, they're all still around, wow. and uh, none of them. We went so far as none of us, none of us smoke to this day, even though, my, and my dad didn't, my mother didn't. Mm -hmm. So you, there are certain things that are built in, and uh, I think that was just mm -hmm. part of it. So it's a family value. Family yes. values, mm -hmm. and you can take all the ethics courses you want in college, and it won't do much, except you'll fill out the form and pass the exam, but that won't change mm -hmm. too much. Mm -hmm. I do think probably on this whole ethics thing, maybe case studies may be the best way to go, and I don't know how much of that goes on right now. Uh, Actually, that is a, um, an important pedagogy, at least in uh, 
in, for that kind of thing. In, well, in just in college in general, but yeah. uh, well, there are various um, organizations that have case study competitions right. and. and uh, yeah, they're they're valuable because they they allow. Well, you want discussion. people that got out of got into trouble because of the way they handle, it, and people that avoided trouble because of the way they handle. It. Larry mm -hmm. Foster, of course, being a perfect example mm -hmm. of how to do it right. Right. Now right. a lot of the financial firms don't know how to do it right. Mm -hmm. They're not used to that. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, too bad. Mm -hmm. But I don't think an ethics course changes a a basic philosophy too much. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you give that person two choices, then one says, this looks like we might get away with it, but we just might do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. The problem is lawyers have the problem. They got to defend people that are guilty. <laughs> I don't know how you do that. They know how to do it. But they know how to do it, and yeah. you have the right, right. to have mm -hmm. that kind of thing and right. to create a reasonable doubt. Right. Why don't you talk to us about how you became involved with the Page Society? How did that all develop? Start at, start at the beginning. Well, it was Ed Block's idea that when we're going to break up the Bell system, he thought we didn't want to lose the Arthur Page legacy, if you want to call it that. And so it was his idea to set up a foundation or a society and that the key members would be people from the Bell companies that were spun off, like the Jack Cotons of the world, people like that. So when I was transferred over there at uh, his request, uh, he asked me if I'd put together the thing. and. Uh, so I worked with our lawyers, and uh, we had a vice president out in Pennsylvania, Zimmerman, uh, Zimmy, and uh, we had our first annual meeting out there at the, uh, uh, well, what do you call that inn out there in Hershey, Hershey. at the Hershey Inn. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I just thought that what Arthur Page said and what was written was the way public relations ought to be done. And if we could get people to embrace that, the public relations profession could maybe get maximum respect. It's still tough sometimes, you know. PR is not always sitting on the elbow of the chief executive. Right. But uh, we thought this would be a good and we would only allow people that were the top decision maker. We're not going to like be like Public Relations Society of America where if you're the newsletter editor you can join. Mm -hmm. So we've kept it that way and I never thought it would be very big, but it's now what, 300? Well, it's more than that. A little I mean, 300 and three, some. 350 maybe. Yeah. So, but I think as more and more people have expo been exposed to the conferences and the kind of speakers we get, mm -hmm. And the publications. And the publications. In fact, you know, some of our friends were the editors of that. Jim Brunson, you probably heard his name. And then Ed Nieder and his wife. They did, you know, pro bono, really. They did it. We didn't have any money. I was the guy trying to get the money. <laughs> you know, you'd get somebody say, can you get $1,000 out of your budget? <laughs> and we didn't have a professional secretary at the mm -hmm. time. We couldn't. So we did it all in-house. But I'm just delighted the way it's evolved. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Bell system is a minor part now. I mean, I'm <laughs> lucky to have any ex-Bell people on there anymore, except I guess Coton may still be on. Yes, oh, Coton is on the page and center Laura, board. And Marilyn Laurie, I think, mm -hmm. got involved, which is right. good. Right. Dick Martin, is he? Uh, I have a lot of um, videos of him interviewing yeah. scads of people. See, yes. Dick Martin became the executive vice president, PR, for AT&T. He started with Western Electric. Oh. And he was one of the people we hired when I was there. And uh, 
Boom, there he is. Mm -hmm. And one of the others we hired was Kathy Fitzgerald, who became the head of public relations for the Bell Labs and Lucen, when it became mm -hmm. Lucen, you know, Western Electric. And she was also hired by Western Electric. So the two top people mm -hmm. in those two spinoffs, Lucen and AT&T, were ex-Western Electric mm -hmm. people, quite a ways down the line when I retired, but uh, we thought they were bright, and they were. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> they were great additions. Yeah. Um, what were those early meetings like with the Page Society? Well, we had speakers, and then we had some of the, uh, a few of these, uh, I'll call them uh, founders, you might say, or early, what do you call those people that are? Pioneers. Pioneer types, uh, Harold Burson, mm -hmm. uh, Lou Harris, people like that. We'd get because they were working for AT&T in the Bell system on occasion, we were able to get them. I had to have to look at the agenda to know which mm -hmm. one, but they were there. We got a couple of academics on, and uh, in fact, one of them at least is still there. He's up at Boston University now. Starts with a W. Wright? Don yeah. Wright? Yeah, Don Wright, I think. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, we had very intimate meetings, and uh, but we didn't have major speakers the way you did. We didn't bring in CEOs and people like mm -hmm. that. You had to get people that were somewhat allied mm -hmm. with the business of public relations. Now, it started out being mostly um, Bell oh, yeah. people. How if did it that change? I don't think it would have survived. Right, but it, it, it changed then. Can you, do you remember, were you involved in it when it, it started broadening? Well, How did that come about? I think it came about when Larry Foster got involved because mm -hmm. he brought the right interest and the right background, you might say. And uh, I would say, I don't know if he was the first non-Bell president of the Arthur Page Society, but if he wasn't, he was awful. I think he was. I think he was. Mm -hmm. And uh, we talked about broadening it to get and we had to get it beyond the bell system and uh, the old bell system. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we did, and then we got some non-bell people on the membership committee so they could get the word out more, you know. And mm -hmm. uh, gradually then, after we started getting some quality programs, mm -hmm. it, uh, it just kept, kept growing. Mm -hmm. And there was always a question of how many of these PR firms do you want, or should it all be corporate? But we broadened it out. And let me ask you a couple general questions. Um, what's the role of the economic bottom line in ethical decision making? And there are a lot of gray areas. There are a lot of gray areas. Mm -hmm. Right. I know our lawyers used to say, Bob, if you don't want anybody to know about it, don't ever write it down. Now, why all these people put it on emails, I don't know. But that just, <laughs> I used to think when you press the delete button, it was gone. <laughs> it's not gone. And uh, I don't know why people aren't aware that that's uh, not a good thing. So I don't know. Ethics, I think until you are in that spot, you really don't know for sure what you do. I mean, you think you do, mm -hmm. but if your boss is saying one thing and you say, that ain't right, boss, what's going to happen? Right. Yeah. So PR has a problem in a sense because it's driven more by the legal department and the marketing department. And uh, you're there to advise. Right. You're the counselor. <laughs> you're the, but you're not necessarily the one that makes the final decision. Mm -hmm. All right. Did you have a direct line? Hold on. 
let's drink some water. We'll cut this part out. <laughs> yeah, mm. direct line. Did you have a, a direct line to the, the CEO in your positions? I did, but you know, uh, at one time, toward the end of my Western Electric career, they suddenly created executive vice presidents. And then, so instead of reporting directly to the president, I reported to an executive vice president who had personnel, PR, and I don't know, maybe one or two other, accounting. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, he wasn't one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. And he felt he wanted to make certain decisions and didn't want me talking to certain people up there. So uh, that's why I say PR frequently has a problem because they do not always let you go directly. They right. put you, maybe you're under legal uh, or some other thing. And uh, that happened to me after I had a direct line that would at be Western difficult. Electric. And I didn't like it. What about when you went to AT&T? Well, at and you know, I worked with Ed Block, basically, but I know a couple times Charlie Brown, who was the chairman, I was in there to talk to him on different things. I didn't make that initiative. He did. Uh, I mean, I, uh, let's say there wasn't any blockage, but I had no reason normally mm -hmm. to go directly to him because that was a more of the operations kind of the business. and. Mm -hmm. I wasn't that directly involved in some of that stuff. That was Ed's job, <laughs> if there was anybody. <laughs> what was the biggest challenge that you faced in your career? I think that last thing I mentioned, probably. I mean, after having access to the top person and the division heads, the senior vice presidents of a couple of the major thing, and then I have a boss coming in and say, you can't talk to him anymore. I would take several of my crew over to talk to him because he would tell me what was going on, what their plans were for the next six months, you might say. And uh, I didn't have that access anymore. I get it informally maybe, but I mean, I couldn't sit down with two or three of staff people. So I'd say that was the biggest uh, problem that I ever had in PR, mm -hmm. uh, definitely. Mm -hmm. So going over to AT&T was sort of a breath of fresh air in that regard. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I could, right. well, I was asked to set certain things up and I just did it. You know? mm -hmm. The foundation and things of that nature. Okay, let's see here. What time? What do we have here? I should have worn a watch. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, okay, I still that. Um, one of the more interesting things I did, Junior Achievement, you may have heard of Junior oh, Achievement. Oh, yes. Uh, we had one in New York, and uh, it wasn't doing too well, and so New York Tell guy who was involved got a hold of me and said, Bob, could you get involved? So I, be I went over there and ended up becoming president of Junior <laughs> Achievement in New York, because he said if, if the Bell system doesn't take it over, it's liable not to survive. So I did it for a year or two, and then uh, New York Tell vice president did it for a couple of years. Not a PR man in this case. And then Frank Carey, who was the chairman of IBM, <laughs> we mm -hmm. took over. He could do more than any of us because he was the top man. But, mm -hmm. uh, but things like that were interesting. And yeah. But I got involved with the Public Relations Society, and I got certified, you know, Whichever that's, I don't think that was worth a lot. But uh, you had on there a question, I remember on there about, do you call it communications it's or warm. public relations? Right. My own feeling is public relations 
is a better term, because that's what we're trying to do. Communication, you know, that could be newsletters, it could be uh, all kinds of little things. Uh, but everybody seems to be moving toward communication, but to me, public relations says it's public and it's out there, and that's what Arthur Page was talking about, too. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with the press, with the public? Uh, you know, the Bell System always did a lot of work before rape cases to make sure the public understood the problem. We did a lot of that in our PR department when it was going to be bargaining, labor bargaining. We put some good stories in our house organs about how well people were doing that were in the bargaining unit. And, uh, you know, it was a, just a good way to keep people posted on, you know, we're not starving to death, we're doing well, and uh, bargaining's coming up. We didn't say anything about that, but uh, it all tied together a little bit because there was a public feeling about it or an employee feeling. You know, we had 210,000 employees at Western Electric at its height, which is a lot of folks. That is. Yeah. Mm. In fact, at one time when I was treasurer of the company, we had the fifth largest pension fund in the United States because of all these people. And I enjoyed that. That sort of was good training because we'd meet with the people that were investing our pension money, uh, uh, the bankers, mm -hmm. people like that. So you learn a lot about dealing with people that way. So even though you didn't have a PR background in a sense, uh, that was always very helpful, I think. Right. What do you think about all the the new technology and the the <laughs> the effect that's having on on Social. on public relations and on ethical decision making? Well, I was, I don't know enough about it myself, but uh, certainly uh, when you get blogs and all that stuff, I mean, this stuff gets out fast. You don't have to wait for the morning paper. So it obviously complicates. The job and the problem is how do you get facts out there? Mm -hmm. But it's important, therefore, that you keep a flow of information out there about your company, about your business, so that when people hear this from a blogger, let's say, that at least they raise a question in their mind and say, I wonder, that's not what I heard. But it is a complication, and I don't know. There are people out there to get you. They don't like you because you're big. In other words, I don't know about the bankers. I don't know what they're, what they really, what really should happen there. But there are a lot of people that don't like them. Okay. Yeah. That's for sure. <laughs> uh, well, the automobile business, same way, to a degree, mm -hmm. although Ford seems to have done very well. Right. And it's interesting that the former head of AT&T is now the chairman of the yeah. board of General of Western of General Motors, mm -hmm. and now the acting CEO. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he seems to be doing a pretty good job. Yeah. But yeah, I think the social networking, bloggers, Twitter—I don't know any of that stuff, and I don't want to. I must say, I have never tweeted. No, I wouldn't know what a tweet was. I thought it was a bird. <laughs> <laughs> I asked you about your, your challenges. Let me ask you, um, for which of your accomplishments are you most proud of and why? Why are you proud? Oh, I don't know. There weren't any real milestones, in my opinion. Uh, one of the most interesting things we did when I was the public relations head at Western Electric, you've heard of the Hawthorne studies, you know, where they, in the plant out there in Chicago, the, they changed the light levels and watched how people reacted. And they were surprised how, no matter what you did, the production improved and improved and improved. And it was because of the attention people were getting. 
So they decided we ought to have the 50th anniversary of the Hawthorne studies, which is around 1923 or four. And so we ran that out there at the Hawthorne plant. We had a lot of academics come that were involved in that sort of work. And it was a fascinating exchange of ideas and reference back to the Hawthorne studies. But it was, it was sort of a fun thing. Uh, but you know, I don't think there's any great milestone. We had little problems like we were building a new plant in Buffalo and decided the way the business was going, that even though it was started, still framing, it had to stop. So that was a PR problem out there with the, the local Congress to people. Um, but, uh, and then we made some surveys of our factories to see what the attitude was of people toward uh, the business. And, uh, you know, those were all interesting things, but we didn't have any Tylenol crisis. Okay. So. Those surveys, would you design them yourselves or did you? We had a professional uh, design them, although we, you know, approved them. And, uh, and then when we'd have a company conference, I would make a presentation and show what the different factories, how it looked mm -hmm. and uh, where they needed to make changes. And of course we shared it with them anyhow but right. to get a better employee attitude. And uh, it depended on who the general manager was in a lot of cases. Right. Because when I was in charge of the Los Angeles operation, I used the thing I always did was get out of the office and walk down to the shop where they're putting together teletype networks, repairing phones, assembling stuff, or to the warehouse where we were shipping stuff off. And so you got to know the people. And then when you had a grievance that came to you, the union came up, and the, there were a few cases where I had to agree with the union. Then some of my friends there and said, Bob, you can't do that. That's not good. I said, well, I think they were right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, you have that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Interesting uh, work. Okay. Mm -hmm. Had nothing to do with PR in a sense. But, uh, mm. but you learn a lot when you sure. have your first meeting with a union, for example. You know, you don't get schooled on this thing. Yeah. Is there anything else that uh, that we haven't that I haven't asked you no. that you want to uh, talk about for a little bit? Uh, no, I I think the fact that Arthur Page Society has grown and is going in the direction it seems to be going is certainly. Uh, says it was well worthwhile, and I think as public relations people are going to find bigger problems as time goes on. Having a place like this to go in a network of people you can talk to is uh, great. I mm -hmm. mean, you couldn't have done it in any other operation that was going that I know of. Mm -hmm. So, but, uh, no, I've... Uh, well retired, so I don't have any opinions on some things anymore. Well, let me ask you this, because I think you'll have something to say about yeah. this. Um, part of what we hope, yeah. we don't know, but in, in the future, 20, 25 years down mm -hmm. the road, um, students, other scholars will be watching this, yeah. taking a look at all the different folks and what they had mm -hmm. to say. Um, is there anything that you think is very important that you would like students who are studying PR now to know when they go out on their first jobs? Well, the one thing, this was under Ed Block and he could talk about it, how do you measure what's going on in public relations? And we did, I forget the guy's name, he's long since retired, probably dead, uh, but we had 
results. And I think one of the biggest problems that PR has is it's hard to measure mm -hmm. how effective your work is. You can probably measure some of the product advertising because, you know, the number of units sold is going up. But when you have an ad that's more of a get to know you ad, you don't know whether that's worth doing or not. And then there's internal publications. How effective are they? And I think they're very important.